Welcome to this time of worship at West Salem Christian Church. It's an honor to be together, to be able to join our hearts and minds together as we come into the presence of God and, and worship Him for who He is and all He's done for us. So let's uh, go into this time and spend this next hour or so together uh, just opening our, our hearts and our minds up to God as He speaks to us through His Word and through our time together and, uh, and allow Him to shape us into the people that he's called us to be and, uh, and as he calls us into his will in this world. Oh, praise the 
Good morning to everyone. Would you open your Bibles and turn to Nehemiah chapter 9, beginning with the end of verse 5 and reading to the end of verse 8. Nehemiah is located three books before the book of Psalm. Again, <clears throat> that is Nehemiah chapter 9. And reading from the last part of verse 5 to the end of verse 8. Blessed be your glorious name, and may it be exalted above all blessing and praise. You alone are the Lord. You made the heavens, even the highest heavens, and all their starry host, the earth and all that is on it, the seas and all that is in them. You gave life to everything, and the multitudes of heaven worship you. You are the Lord God who chose Abram and brought him out of Ur of the Chaldeans and named him Abraham. You found his heart faithful to you, and you made a covenant with him to give to his descendants the land of the Canaanites, Hittites, Amorites, Perizzites, Jebusites, and Girgashites. You have kept your promise because you are righteous. Would you bow with me and let's pray together to our covenant God, who is worthy of glory, honor, and praise. Heavenly Father, you are the God of creation, the author of life, and the redeemer of men. Your promises are always kept because you are righteous. These attributes and so many more are the reason for our praise. Above all, you are a God of relationship. Throughout Scripture, you can be seen reaching out to people, protecting them mercifully, teaching and instructing them, extending your grace and patience to them, and ultimately sacrificing yourself for them and for us in the person of Jesus Christ, your Son. God, we honor and worship you today because your name is to be honored above all the earth. At this moment, we pause and confess our sins, repenting and giving thanks that the blood of Jesus Christ washes them away and they are remembered no more. We pray for obedience to be more present in us and rebellion to be less so in our lives. Thank you this week for the presence of your Holy Spirit, whose convicting and comforting voice guided us in our walk. Thank you for the many blessings you granted us this week, including the necessities of life. May we come to see fully all of the ways you have blessed and protected us as we are so often oblivious to them. Father, your word has been empowered by you to reach into the hearts of lost mankind as the members of this church proclaim your word and share the testimony of the great things you have done for us. Use us for your glory as you seek and save the lost. May we seek your will and not our own in this mission. We pray for one another, asking that faith might abound in the face of adversity, that Satan be bound and thwarted in his attacks, and that grace might be lived out in each of us as we abide in you and your word. And now, Father, we pray for humble, open hearts as we hear your word today. O oh, grant that it makes changes and bears fruit in us, your servants. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen.
This is the fourth and final week of this series that we've going through called Eyes Like a Lion. And as we begin this week, I want to talk about something that I haven't mentioned in a while. And that is the vision that we have as West Salem Christian Church for each and every person who is a part of this church. That vision is based on what Jesus describes as the greatest commandment. In Mark 12, 30 and 31, Jesus says, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. And then he goes on to say, Love your neighbor as yourself. And just as a quick recap, when we talk about those things, when we talk about heart, we're talking about participating in worship on a regular basis. When we talk about soul, we're talking about involvement in a community group or Bible study with other members of the church. We have two small groups that meet on alternating Thursday evenings. We have an adult Sunday school class at 9.15 on Sunday mornings. Uh, there's a Thursday morning Bible study that meets at the church building at 10 a.m. And Arise Women's Ministry uh, meets on Monday nights. And we're hoping to start uh, more groups, hopefully soon. When we talk about mind, we're talking about consistent personal Bible study and prayer time. When we think about strength, we mean using our resources and talents and abilities to serve in a ministry inside the church, but also using our strength to serve in our community in ways that impact people for the gospel. We have uh, a harvest carnival and trunk or treat coming up next Sunday, and it's going to take a lot of work and, and planning and, and uh, manpower to pull off that event. And that's a great way to get involved in serving. And when we talk about loving your neighbor as yourself, we're talking about sharing our faith and proclaiming the gospel to the people around us through our words and actions and through the lives that we live. Those are the things that we want everyone in the church to try to be involved in on a regular basis because those things will help us to have spiritual eyes like a lion, like we've been talking about through the, the, the past weeks in this series. Those things will help us to take in and process as much of the light of Jesus as possible. Last week, we talked about how Jesus is described as the conquering lion of the tribe of Judah. But he wasn't the kind of lion that everyone expected. Here's what it says in Revelation 5, 5 and 6. It says, Then one of the elders said to me, Do not weep. See, the lion of the tribe of Judah, the root of David, has triumphed. He is able to open the scroll and the seven seals. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain, standing at the center of the throne encircled by the four living creatures and the elders. Jesus is described as the triumphant lion of the tribe of Judah, while at the same time appearing as the lamb that had been slain. Jesus had the boldness and the authority and the power of a lion, but he chose to use it in a sacrificial way like a lamb. And we can do the same thing. We can have eyes like a lion. We can live boldly because we can see our lives, our circumstances, and the world around us for what they are because we can see them in the light of the person of Jesus. But we can also choose to live humble, patient, selfless lives because of the fact that we can see Jesus clearly. Being bold doesn't mean being pushy or forceful all the time. Sometimes being bold means stepping back and waiting. Here's what Proverbs 28.1 says. The wicked flee, though no one pursues, but the righteous are as bold as a lion. As we've talked about over the last three weeks, if we have spiritual eyes like a lion, the closer that we get to Jesus, the farther we'll be able to see. That even when we go through painful situations, our faith and our trust can grow, and we don't have to let fear push us in a direction that God doesn't want us to go, but we can run toward the roar. And we can live lives of bold, humble confidence in our Savior. So today I want to start by looking at a time in Jesus' life where we can get the idea that he didn't really come across like a lion. Today we're going to be mostly in John chapter 14. And this is a time when Jesus is between a great victory and a great tragedy in his life. At the beginning of this week of Jesus' life, he entered Jerusalem in what we now call the triumphal entry. He sent a clear message that he was coming to Jerusalem as king. And the people responded by shouting Hosanna, which means save now. They were saying, we are ready for a savior. They wanted someone to save them from the Romans. They were ready for a lion of a leader. 
but they got a different kind of lion than they expected because what they needed was a lamb. And so in this week, between the triumphal entry and the crucifixion, Jesus goes from a great victory to the apparent tragedy of his death. And when we look at our lives, oftentimes they're lived in those those spaces between the victories and the tragedies, the highs and the lows, the peaks and the valleys. And when Jesus shows us during what Jesus shows us during this week of his life is the foundation of our faith can be strengthened in the times between victory and tragedy. But we won't be able to do that unless we have spiritual eyes like a lion, because if we don't, we won't be able to see past the tragedy and prepare for the victory. At the end of that week, after Jesus' victorious entry into Jerusalem, we find he and his disciples gathered in an upper room for the Passover meal. And Jesus drops the bombshell that one of them will betray him. And then he tells them he's going to be arrested. And not only that, but he will be put to death. And the disciples are, of course, shocked. And they they can't comprehend what they're hearing. And even though Jesus goes on to tell them that everything will be okay, because he will return They can't see that victory because they're too focused on the tragedy. But in the midst of all of this, Jesus says this in John 14, verse 12. Very truly, I tell you, whoever believes in me will do the works I have been doing, and they will do even greater things than these, because I am going to the Father. The disciples had to be thinking, you just said that one of us was going to betray you and that you were going to be executed. We've depended on you for everything. We put all of our hopes on you. How are we going to do greater things than you if you're gone? But when you look at it, surprise, surprise, Jesus was right. Just look at what followers of Jesus have accomplished around the world in his name. Just today, Christian health professionals all around the world will help to physically heal thousands of times more people than what Jesus healed during his earthly life. Today, Christian people will feed thousands of times more hungry people than the 5,000 that Jesus fed with those two or with those loaves and fish. Today, humanitarian aid from Christian people is going to those in need in Gaza and in Israel. Think of all the schools built in the name of Jesus, all the orphanages built in the name of Jesus, all the overlooked and marginalized people who have been loved and defended in the name of Jesus. All around the world, the church of Jesus has physically done a mo- or exponentially more in his name than he did during his life and ministry. He did the one thing we couldn't do. He paid for our sins, but he's called us to love people the way that he loved people and to do it on a grand scale. And each one of us has the chance to impact people every single day if we're taking our role as ambassadors for Jesus seriously. But how have the followers of Jesus been able to accomplish so much? The Spirit gives us the power to accomplish the work of the kingdom. Jesus has gone to his Father in heaven. We cannot sit with him at a table like the disciples did. We can't walk with him and listen to him like the disciples did. But Jesus points us to the fact that each of us now has direct access to him. In John 14, 15 through 17, Jesus says, If you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you, and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. The world cannot accept him because it neither sees him nor knows him, but you know him, for he lives with you and will be in you. We, each and every one of us, has access to the spirit of God. The disciples had Jesus in the flesh right there to ask questions, to see and learn from. But when Jesus ascended back to heaven, we now live in the age of the spirit. And that spirit can be with each and every follower of Jesus everywhere all the time. And he can and will equip and empower and lead us into the work and the mission of the kingdom. Dr. Mark Moore compares how the Holy Spirit works in our lives to a sextant. A sextant is a navigational tool that sailors use to know where they are on the open sea when they can't see land. They were used for hundreds of years, and in fact, in 2016, the United States Navy started training their officers to use sextants again, because you can't always rely on GPS satellites. But the way a sextant works is that in the day, you can use the sun, or at night, you can use the moon or a star, and if you know the date 
and the star that you're looking at, you can triangulate the star with the horizon and be able to determine your location. So in this analogy, the star represents Jesus. The horizon represents our lives, where we live. And the sextant represents the Holy Spirit. When we look through the lens of the Holy Spirit looking to Jesus, we can align ourselves with him. So looking through the lens of the Holy Spirit is the most powerful way we can have eyes like a lion, to see Jesus and to navigate according to his will. Now, anybody that you talk to will probably tell you that they have felt the presence of God, or at least they may say they've had a spiritual experience, whether it's a moving song or maybe looking at a sunset at the beach. Maybe it's being out in the woods during a rainstorm or, or hearing a, a passionate uh, presentation. Whatever it is, everyone has felt those moments. And for us who are Christians, those are often the work of the Holy Spirit. But the Holy Spirit is so much more than just a feeling. He's more than just goosebumps on your skin. When we align the lens of the Holy Spirit with Jesus, the Spirit is not just a feeling that we feel, but a person that we can follow. And when we have spiritual eyes like a lion, where we can see Jesus that way, we can know where we are and where we're going. So I want to talk about three ways that can help us align our vision with eyes like a lion. First, stay in your territory. A lot of us here have probably seen the movie The Lion King, and in that movie, there's a lion cub named Simba whose father, Mufasa, is the king of the lions. At one point, Simba and his dad are on top of Pride Rock looking out over the savanna. And Mufasa says, everything the light touches is our kingdom. And then Simba asks, what about that shadowy place over there? And his father answers, that is beyond our borders. You must never go there. And later in the movie, when Simba does go to that shadowy place, he gets himself in trouble. And it's interesting because that's actually pretty true to life of real lions. Lions in the wild have a territory about 100 square miles, and that's a lot of space. But if a lion goes outside of that territory, he loses the protection of the alpha male and of the pride. Now let's go back and read John 14, 15 through 17 again. Jesus says, if you love me, keep my commands, and I will ask the Father, and he will give you another advocate to help you and be with you forever, the spirit of truth. If we're not doing our best to keep the commands of Jesus, if we're getting outside our territory, so to speak, then we're not going to be able to hear the leading of the Holy Spirit as clearly. And I'm not talking about legalism here, trying to earn God's love through our actions. As Christians, we have a big territory. We have a lot of freedom. But if we get out of the bounds of the commands of Jesus, we're going to lose our ability to clearly hear from the Holy Spirit. So let's not wander. Let's not push the limits and see how close we can get to the line without maybe going over. Let's not get tempted by shadowy places outside of our borders. Let's stay in our territory. And part of that is the way that we do our next point here. We need to stay with the pride. Like I said last week, lions are the only big cats that live and hunt in a group. And those groups are called a pride of lions. Now, lions are regal and powerful and majestic, the king of the beasts. And you might think that they can survive about anything. But in the wild, only about one in eight lions grow to adulthood. When lions are about two years old, they're pushed out of their pride. And if they don't form their own pride or become part of another, they almost always die. Their place in a pride provides safety and protection and fulfillment and development and strength and understanding of what their place and their role is. And the same is true for us as the body of Christ in the church. We need each other. When you participate in worship, you experience the Holy Spirit more. Yes, the Holy Spirit can will and does speak to us individually, but the Holy Spirit oftentimes speaks more clearly to and through all of his people together. The Holy Spirit is the Spirit of God, and God does everything in the context of relationship. He has eternally existed in relationship, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And one of the ways that he has designed us to align our view with him is through his body, the church. If we go back to John 14, verses 18 through 20, Jesus says, I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Before long, the world will not see me, but you will see me. 
Because I live, you also will live. On that day, you will realize that I am in my Father, and you are in me, and I am in you. Now, Jesus is talking to his disciples here. And each time he says, you, I will come to you, you will see me, all of those yous are plural. He's saying you as in all of you. Because God intended for us to live life in community and relationship with him and with each other. That's why participating in worship and being part of a small group and serving together are things that were on that list of goals that we have for each person in this church. We need each other, and we can align our view with Jesus and be attentive to the leading of the Spirit better when we do it together. The third thing that we can do is pay attention to the wind. A lot of times when you see pictures or video of lions in the wild, it looks like they're yawning all the time. They curl their lips back and they stick their tongues out. But a lot of times when you see them doing that, they aren't yawning. They're actually tasting the wind. Just like the eyes of lions can take in all kinds of light, they're so in tune with their surroundings that they can taste traces of their prey from miles away on the wind. Now, in the Old Testament, the Hebrew word for spirit is ruach. And the New Testament, the Greek word for spirit is pneuma. And both of those words also mean breath or wind. So if we pay attention to the wind or the spirit, we'll be able to align our view more with Jesus. And we can understand more of what the spirit is saying to us in this world if we know more of what God has said to us in his word. Going back to John 14 in verses 25 and 26, Jesus says, All this I have spoken while still with you, but the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you all things and will remind you of everything I have said to you. Scripture tells us that God has spoken to us in these last days through his Son. And all of what we know of what Jesus said and did is found in the Bible. And Jesus says here that the Holy Spirit will remind us of everything he has said. So the Holy Spirit works in tandem with the Word of God. If we want the Holy Spirit to be more than just a feeling, we need to let him speak to us and reveal to us the word of God. So like we said at the beginning, all of us are somewhere between a victory and a tragedy, and some of us might be right in the middle of one of those things right now. But wherever we are, we can strengthen the foundations of our faith. And in doing that, we can focus on the weight, W-A-I-T, not the weight, W-E-I-G-H-T. All of us are carrying some kind of weight. And as we carry that weight, what happens? The weight often doesn't get lighter, but we can, as we carry that weight, we can get stronger. And we can carry that weight because we know what we're waiting for. Toward the end of John 14 in verses 27 through 29, Jesus says, peace I leave with you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. You heard me say, I am going away and I am coming back to you. If you loved me, you would be glad that I am going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. I have told you now before it happens, so that when it does happen, you will believe. Jesus told these followers, one of them would betray him, and Judas did. He said Peter would deny him three times, and Peter did. He said he would be arrested, and he was. He said he would be crucified, and he was crucified. But he also said three days later he would rise again, and he did. He said he would send the Comforter, the Holy Spirit, and he has. And he said he would come back again and take us to be with him, and he will. Jesus keeps his promises. So whether we're experiencing a victory or a tragedy or whether we're somewhere in between, Let's strengthen the foundations of our faith and let's be about the work of the kingdom as the Spirit empowers us. Let's have spiritual eyes like a lion and look through the lens of the Holy Spirit to align ourselves with the will of Jesus. The lion of the tribe of Judah has triumphed. He's given us a place in his body and he has given us his spirit so we can carry the weight of this life as we wait on him because we know that we're not alone. Let's pray. God, thank you for the gift of the Spirit. Thank you that we are not alone. Thank you that Jesus keeps his promises. Help us to 
keep his commands. And we know that following Jesus is not about just keeping the rules. We know it's not about legalism and it's not about being better than anybody else. But we know that when we stay in the territory of the lion of the tribe of Judah, we are going to be in the best place that we can be. We're grateful that Jesus keeps his promises and that he has promised that he will take us to be with him where he is. We look forward to that day. And as we look forward to that day, we carry some weight with us. But we know, as we trust you, that you will be right alongside us to help us to carry that weight. And we know that we also have important things to do for your kingdom. So open our eyes to what you have for us to do. Help us to align our view through the Holy Spirit and and focus our eyes on Jesus so that we are aimed toward him. And so that everything we do can be for the glory of him and for the the forwarding of your kingdom. Thank you for loving us so much, and, and we look forward to the day where we can spend eternity with you in your presence. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. There's a grace when the heart is under fire Another way when the walls are closing in When I look at the space between Where I used to be and this reckoning I know I would never be alone There was another in the fire Standing next to me there was another in the waters Holding back the seas Should I ever need reminding How I have been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire All my death left for death beneath the waters I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore Should I fall in the space between What remains of me and this reckoning Either way I will bow to the things of this world I know I will never be alone There is another in the fire Standing next to me There is another in the waters Holding back the sea Should I ever be reminded What power set me free There is a grace that holds nobody Now that power lives in me There is another in the fire There is another in the fire Oh, there is another in the fire Oh, there is another in the fire Oh, I can see the light in the darkness As the darkness bows to Him I can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where's thin. I can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls gave in. Nothing stands between us. Nothing stands between There is no other name but the name that is Jesus. 
He who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things I've seen and this reckoning. I know I will never be alone. Yeah, I know I will never be alone. There'll be another in the fire standing next to me. There'll be another in the water holding back the seas. Should I ever need reminding, how could you be to me? I'll count the joy from every battle. Cause I know that's where you'll be I'll count the joy come every battle Cause I know that's where you'll be This is our time of communion. In my message this morning I read a couple of verses of Revelation chapter 5 where Jesus is described as the lion of the tribe of Judah who's triumphed, but then is represented as the lamb who's been slain. And I, that's one of my favorite passages of Scripture because it's such a clear representation of all of who Jesus is. The triumphal lion of the tribe of Judah with all the authority and the power, but who chose to sacrifice himself as God's perfect lamb. And we see the response to the presence of the Lamb in heaven as we continue on in Revelation chapter 5. It, it talks about the way that the angels and the, the elders in heaven responded. Beginning in verse 9 of Revelation 5, it says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe and language and people and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. Then I looked and heard the voice of many angels, numbering thousands upon thousands and 10,000 times 10,000. They encircled the throne and the living creatures and the elders. In a loud voice, they were saying, Worthy is the Lamb who was slain to receive power and wealth and wisdom and strength and honor and glory and praise. Then I heard every creature in heaven and on earth and under the earth and on the sea and all that is in them, saying to him who sits on the throne and to the Lamb, be praise and honor and glory and power forever and ever. So we take the bread together this morning to remember the sacrifice and the victory that Jesus won as his body was broken on the cross. And we take the juice to remember the blood of the perfect Lamb of God that took away our sins. Let's pray. Father, it's a humbling thing to think about what Jesus has done for us. And all those words about the glory and honor and praise that he deserves are almost fall short when we think about all that his sacrifice means for us. And so we are honored to remember that sacrifice, and we pray that you would help us to carry with us that memory each day. And because he gave so much for us that we would give ourselves to him every day and live our lives in the light of the truth and the reality that we have a living Savior, and we are overjoyed knowing that, uh, that we have been called back into your family and been made right with you because of the price that Jesus paid. And we thank you in his name. Amen. We always provide an opportunity for you to give financially if you'd like to support the ministry of West Salem Christian Church. And this morning, as we consider that, I just want to ask a question that we will all have an answer to, I'm sure, but our answers might be a little bit different. How much does it cost for a gallon of gas? You probably know right off the top of your head. I know the last time I got gas, it was $3.85 a gallon, and I filled up because that was the best price I'd seen in a long time. 
but we keep track of the price of gas because we need gas. We depend on gas to get our cars around to the places that we need to get to. But the problem with gas is that you put it into your car, you turn the key and drive away from that gas station and you're already burning up the gas that you just bought. And everything in this world that we invest in and that we buy and we use our resources for is that way. It's diminishing and it's depleting and it's, it's fleeting. And Jesus asks us to have some perspective and, and think about places that we can invest in that aren't fleeting and diminishing. And we can invest in the kingdom of God and in the mission of the gospel in this world. But God also says that he loves a cheerful giver. So we don't try to uh, guilt anybody into giving or, or demand that anyone give, but we encourage each of you to give whatever you can give joyfully and, and gladly to God to invest in the mission of the gospel and in West Salem Christian Church as we try to take the good news of Jesus to this community and around the world. So I would encourage you to give this morning uh, in any way that you can uh, to, to acknowledge to God that everything we have is a gift from him and to invest in that kingdom and that mission of the gospel in this place. Well, I'm glad that we got to spend this time together this morning. Thank you for making worship a priority. I want to invite you back next week uh, as we'll be back online here at 1030 a.m. We'll also be meeting in person at the church building. And next week, uh, the 29th of October, we're going to be having our first ever since I've been here, at least in a long time, uh, a harvest carnival and trunk or treat. So I want to just ask you to pray for that, that it would be a great way for us to connect with our community and our neighbors. If you'd like to be involved in that and be a part, um, you can email the church at info at westsalem.church or you can call and, and get more information or let us know how you'd like to be involved. But uh, I want to encourage you to, to, at the very least, pray uh, for that outreach and that event. Let's pray together as we get ready to uh, sing our closing song this morning. Father, thank you for your love. Thank you for inviting us into your kingdom. Thank you for sending Jesus to be the way for us to have a relationship with you again. We thank you that you've given us your spirit as well. We pray that you'd help us to uh, look through the lens of the spirit and to see Jesus clearly and to align our lives with him and, and to do our very best to follow him as closely as we can and to stay in his will. Because we know that you will do great things through us as your people if we do that. And that we will accomplish greater things than we could ever imagine. So we're thankful that you have made us a part of your kingdom and your mission in this world. And we look forward to the great things that you're going to do as we uh, faithfully do our best to, to follow you and to serve you. And we pray in the name of Jesus. Amen.
I am forgiven. The King of Kings calls me His own. Beautiful Savior, I'm yours forever. Jesus Christ, my living hope. Bye, Lee. 